Welcome back to The Ed Show. Thanks for watching tonight. You know, it's hard to believe that any American could survive on $7.25 an hour. The federal minimum wage has been stuck at that number since 2009, and don't expect the conservatives to do anything about it. It's also the current minimum wage in the state of Wisconsin. And if you break this number down, an adult working full-time would earn just $15,080 a year. Those wages barely keep an individual above the federal poverty threshold. Those wages fail to keep a single parent above the poverty line. Now, 100 workers in Wisconsin have filed a complaint with Governor Scott Walker's administration. The coalition led by Wisconsin Jobs Now says the current minimum wage violates a provision in Wisconsin law. The law states that minimum wage must be a living wage. A living wage is defined under the law as this, reasonable comfort, reasonable physical well-being, decent and moral well-being. On Monday, Walker's administration denied Wisconsinites the raise they asked for. Walker's administration responded by writing a letter reading, the department has determined that there is no reasonable cause to believe wages paid to the complainants are not a living wage. I don't trust the Walker administration's calculations, but I do trust the folks over at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, according to them and their living wage calculator. A single parent living in Madison, Wisconsin, would need to make $21.17 an hour to support their family. Joining me tonight are the Rapid Response Panel, Jennifer Epps Addison. She's the Executive Director of Wisconsin Jobs Now. Also with us tonight, Congressman Mark Pocan of Wisconsin and Ruth Conniff, editor of the Progressive Magazine. Great to have all of you with us here tonight. Jennifer, is this fight over? Is this settled or is there a recourse that your organization can take from here? It's absolutely not settled. Look, you know, Governor Scott Walker might think that 725 is a living wage, but there's no reasonable person in this country who believes a family can survive on that amount. So the reality is, is that he is choosing willfully to not follow Wisconsin law. And people should understand that this is not a minimum wage law. This law dates back over 100 years in our state, and it says very clearly that every worker in our state shall be paid a living wage by their employer. That is clearly not happening. In over 100 workers testified to the impossible choices they're forced to make every day. A woman like Brittany Ferguson, who's a hotel housekeeper in Milwaukee, talked about having to put back hot dogs and choose between hot dogs and bread at the grocery store because she didn't have enough money to afford it all. There is no person in this state who thinks that having to choose between hot dogs and bread at a grocery store means you're living in reasonable yeah. comfort and decency. Ruth, isn't this a statement that Walker is anti-worker and that this really underscores where the Republicans are? And if it's in the law, uh, you know, how can he get away with it as you see it? Well, I think that Walker didn't want to be put in this position, and I really applaud Jennifer and her group for uh, for making the point that they're making and getting those 100 workers together, whose situation is very real uh, and very poignant, and you read their individual stories, and these are folks who are homeless, they're on food stamps, and they're working full-time, and I don't think Americans think that's how it ought to be, and so Walker would rather not deal with it, he'd rather not talk about it, and what his administration has said is they've taken a page right from the National Restaurant Association, which is the chief lobbyist against the increase in the minimum wage, to say, oh, Oh, it hurt our economy if we paid workers more. This is a fight that goes back to the beginning of the progressive era, when the Progressive Magazine was founded. This is a 1913 law, and folks in Wisconsin were on the leading edge of a movement to try to do better by workers, and they were saying, we have child labor in this state, we have people who are not able to live on what they're getting, and let's really look at what it costs to live. And you look back at the debate on this law, they said, how much does housing cost? How much does food cost? What can we really offer people? What do we really believe people should have to put up with? Yeah. There was a big pushback by industry, and they've achieved a victory here. And Jennifer's right to make the connection with that era and that fundamental principle. Congressman, isn't the issue here, as far as voters are concerned, do voters who do not make minimum wage, who are doing well, do those people in Wisconsin care about those who are on minimum wage? I mean, that's really what it boils down to. There's not enough minimum wage workers to make a difference in this issue in an election, but are there enough people that care about it? 
You know, people in Wisconsin are hardworking, but we're also very kind-hearted, and uh, there is vast support for raising minimum wage. We know that that helps people uh, who are just getting by in $15,000 a year. The real challenge here is the governor decided uh, that rather than trying to stand up to this image he has of being a tool of the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson, he could have done something right for his constituents, the people of Wisconsin, and instead he decided to side uh, with the people that he wants to fund his presidential campaign and uh, make a stance against the minimum wage increase. It's impossible to get by on $15,000 a year. We have those uh, people who are also getting subsidized health care that all the taxpayers pay for uh, that the governor knows that's part of our state programs, and yet he's choosing to side with the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson rather than the people of Wisconsin, and I don't think that's going to sell well on November 4th. Ruth, you saw the story that we did earlier on North Carolina. There's somewhat of a story very similar to that that has unfolded in Wisconsin. On Monday, the appeals court upheld the Wisconsin stricter voter ID law. What does this mean for voters just weeks out, 25 days? What's the response? Well, the response is people need to know how to get ID and they need to plan on voter ID being in place because the United States Supreme Court could intervene, but it's unlikely. And so we're, we're likely looking at voter ID in this coming uh, election between Scott Walker and Mary Berg. It's a very tight race. They've been neck and neck in the polls. It's going to make a big difference. There's a lot of confusion out there because the governor has refused to allocate money. The state has refused to allocate money to get information to voters. So there are people on the UW campus trying to make sure students get the proper ID. They need a new ID to vote now. And the same thing out in the community. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a grassroots push to get voters to the DMV to get the ID that they need. And that, you know, getting clear information to people and getting them the ID that they need has got to be a huge focus now in the run-up to the election. Jennifer, how big a hurdle is this as you see it? We're ready to go. I, you know, I hearken back to Dr. Barber. We have been on the ground working with people, making sure they have a plan to vote since April. Folks in our community are energized and enthused. And I think what you're going to see with Governor Walker's determined that a Walker wage of 725 is a living wage is that this is really his Mitt Romney moment. This is his 47% moment. And this is our opportunity to seize upon it and to determine what type of state we want to have. You asked the question about do middle class families care about poor and working class families. Well, a recent study out of UWM, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, showed that 73 percent of the folks in our state support raising the minimum wage. About a quarter of our state work, state's workforce is living in poverty wages right now. So that means there's a big group mm. of people who know that raising the minimum wage boosts our economy. There are 13 referendas across the state on the ballot that people can go out and make that determination for themselves. So we're ready to go, and we think that this might just Okay. be what costs Governor Walker his reelection. And Congressman, I can't let you go without asking you the question, why can't Wisconsin create jobs? Minnesota is in the positive. <laughs> Other states surrounding Wisconsin in the positive. What's wrong with Wisconsin that the state can't create jobs? You know, it's not because of our people, because we're, we're extremely hardworking and a business would be smart to locate here. But we have a governor who, since day one of getting elected uh, governor, has been running for president. Uh, he spent a million dollars uh, taking corporate jets uh, to go to Iowa and South Carolina and Iowa and New Hampshire and Iowa. If you notice a you pattern, pin it on Walker. Uh, this is a guy. <laughs> he is running you, you for president. It, you, he doesn't. you pin it on Walker. He has not been doing his job as governor, and on November 4th, we should have let him be a full-time candidate for president, and we should elect Mary Burke to be our full-time governor. That's as really as simple as it is. Mm -hmm.